For those of you who are perhaps visiting, or perhaps have not been paying attention, um, here in Australia, a couple of months ago, we voted in a new government. Anyone remember? I know, it's a bit old news now. But there were four main areas in which commentators and pundits and people said the Australian public was upset with the, with the government and they wanted some change. There were four main issues, four main topic areas that were under discussion. Do you remember what they were? I know, it was a couple of months ago now. First of all, uh, most people were not happy with the current Prime Minister. They had some issues with him. Um, this is me saying this, not, uh, this is commentators saying this, I'm just repeating what they say, don't be political. Um, the people were upset on the lack of climate change action, yeah? People were upset on the, uh, on the lack of representation of women in our parliament, in our government, yeah? And do you remember what the last one was? Wages? No, it was all about an integrity commission. Do you remember that? There was all this discussion and, and all this leading up to the election, there were these discussions about which kind of integrity commission, what powers would they have, who would sit on it, how would it work, all that sort of stuff was, was being discussed left and right. And particularly the Teal, the, the Teal independence um, rose and that was a campaign factor for them was to build a strong integrity commission. So in our media, Across our society, we had this discussion of integrity. Integrity was brought up all the time, which is a problem for me because a few months ago, we decided to put into, this, into the plan for our, our meetings a series called Forgotten Virtues, one of which today is integrity. And yet we've been talking about it for months. Isn't that good? It's, it's my problem. I know you don't care. Right. This is our series called Forgotten Virtues, and we are going to talk about integrity. And now, that's not such a bad thing, uh, because I don't believe that the Integrity Commission or a corruption watchdog would probably be a, a more um, colloquial phrase for it, has actually a lot to do with integrity. It is related, don't get me wrong, it, the, the word does apply to an Integrity Commission. But what I want to talk about is the personal virtue of integrity that I think has been a lot forgotten in our society. Maybe governments have figured it out that it's important, but I think a lot of us personally have a lot to learn about integrity. So that's where we are up to, in case you were wondering. So my first question for you all today is, what is integrity? Um, I'm, I'm asking you for answers. Um, those of you who are watching online, you can might put down in the uh, chat there, what is your understanding of integrity? Would anyone here like to give me some ideas? There are no wrong answers except the ones that aren't right. Would you give me some ideas? Anyone? Truthfulness. Truthfulness. Honesty. Honesty. That's generally where most people cap out. That's generally our understanding, isn't it? Reflected in our living. Now that's a good answer. F ignore that answer for now. <laughs> Your ability to make right decisions is integrity. Accountability. Accountability. That's certainly more about what the Integrity Commission is about, isn't it? And yeah, accountability stems from it. So. Um, uh, you might not know this, but those who are watching at home on live stream are about 30 seconds behind us. You know, it takes 30 seconds to get through to YouTube, so live streaming is not that, actually that live. So they've probably put a whole lot of these comments in, and we haven't seen them yet, so that's okay. But the thing is, and this kind of exercise highlights for us, is that it's not easy to define integrity, is it? We all have these very different ideas from honesty and accountability, and these are all kind of related, but doesn't actually capture what integrity is. And integrity for me is one of those things that is much easier to define by understanding its opposite. You know, there are some things in life, it's just easier to understand something when you understand its opposite. So what for you, what do you understand is the opposite of integrity? What do you think that might be? Dishonesty, obviously we're going to go with all the opposites of the words we've had already. <laughs> Clever thinking, Phil. This is going to go well. What was that? Anyone else have something? Deceiving. Deceiving? Yep, it's all related. 
I'll give you the word. There is a simple word that we have in English, and the word is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is the opposite of integrity. Now, the word hypocrite is a Greek word. I don't need to tell you what the Greek word is because it's there. It's translated pretty much letter for letter into English, and that's the word we have today. But the word we have today doesn't mean what the word meant when Jesus said it in the first century. And it didn't mean what it meant to all the Greeks and everybody living in the first century. In the first century, the word meant, does anyone know? Kind of. Kind of. It means an actor. An actor in a Greek theatre was called a hypocrite. So you could say all actors are hypocrites. I've seen some pretty bad acting. And I don't know if they're that hypocritical. But, and yes, it has to do with masks. Uh, Here's an interesting little tidbit. Some scholars suggest that Jesus and his father were involved in the construction of a giant um, Greek theatre, which was actually constructed during the time when Jesus was about a teenager. Um, And it was constructed in about a few miles away. In a, in a new city, they would build this giant Greek theatre. And it was believed that most carpenters in the area would have been conscripted or brought in to help build this theatre. So it's possible that being a teenager, Jesus was hanging around a theatre, helping build it. That's interesting, isn't it? I don't know, maybe it is. I think it's interesting. Now, so what we say, the, the, the thing about Greek theatre is that the way Greek actors would work, they would rely heavily on masks. So if a Greek actor, a hypocrite, had to play the part of a victorious warrior, they would grab the mask of a victorious warrior and they would put it on and they would play that part. If they had to play the part of a grieving widow, which sometimes goes alongside victorious warriors, they would play the part by putting on the mask of a crying woman. These masks hid their true identity and gave them the ability to present a second identity to the crowd. They had double identities. In Proverbs, Solomon writes, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. So you see how now we understand hypocrisy in the way Jesus uses the words hypocrite to describe the opposite of integrity. Jesus uses the word hypocrite to describe those who are lacking integrity as duplicitous. He draws on the idea of an actor to describe how someone who isn't, doesn't have integrity is someone who is going through life acting like a different version of themselves. Someone who is playing a part that doesn't reflect their heart. Like that rhyme? That's not mine. Tim Keller made that up. It was good. But I took it. It's good. Someone who is playing a part that doesn't reflect their heart. In our modern understanding, we could possibly say that this is a, a hypocrite is someone who is not being true to themselves or to others. And we live in a society that is really, really keen on protecting our self-image aren't we? We like our spin, our own personal marketing campaigns. I don't remember a few years ago, um, there was a massive kerfuffle. One of the Kardashians, all right, we all know the Kardashians, they're all good friends of ours, we all follow them on everything. But one of them, I, I don't know whether it was their fault or the photographer or somebody, released a photo onto social media that shock horror had not been airbrushed. Do you remember this? Ah, oh, man, there's this huge kerfuffle that made our nightly news, for heaven's sake. And it was, it was well, not for heaven's sake, for her sake. Anyway, whatever. Um, it was all these legal letters, all these takedown letters. I mean, they worked so hard to have this mildly airbrushed image. Anyway, it was random. We work so hard. Perhaps we don't all have the resources of the Kardashians, but we all work hard in protecting our image. So, 
we come today to this text in Luke chapter 6. And I break this text down into three parts, three stories. First of all, we're going to talk about specks and planks. Not specks and specks. That's another game show for another time. We're going to talk about specks and planks. We're going to talk about fruit. And we're going to talk about foundations. Sound okay? All right, so now we're just getting started, right? Start the clock. This, um, this piece of the scriptures comes at the end of Jesus' manifesto, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You can read it in Luke chapter 6 or Matthew's chapter 5 and 6. Jesus' long sermon, it's the longest sermon and teaching thing we have from Jesus. A little bit later on um, in the year, uh, we're going to look through the Beatitudes, some of his key phrases and statements that define for us what it looks like to be in the kingdom of God, his, his uh, ideal place that he is talking about. But here we are at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And it says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You actor. You actor. So the first thing to note here is the the, the reason for his statement in here comes after um, a rant against being judgmental. Um, So just before this text in Luke chapter 6 or in Matthew, you'll hear Jesus talking about not being judgmental. So this is related to that. Because it's interesting to note that people try and maintain their facades, they maintain their persona by drawing attention away from their own faults and failings and pointing at the faults and failings of others, don't they? Do anyone know like that? Anyone know someone who is, whose reaction to criticism is to blame someone else? No? Anyone sitting next? No, don't. key, right? It's a very interesting part of human nature and something we need to deal with. The other thing is interesting here, Jesus talks about this plank twice in this text. I know, you might just read through it and say, oh, plank in your eye, speck in his eye. All right, that's all we need to know. But twice he says plank. First of all, he said, first time he says, he says, why do you pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? There are some things we know about ourselves. I know, that sounds profound, right? There are things. We know a lot about our faults and our failings. If you don't get married, you will. (laughs) My wife's at Brimbank this morning, so I can say what I like. Oh, wait, it's being recorded. Sorry, hon. We know a lot about our faults and failings. You don't need to get married to know your faults and failings. Just stop and think for a moment. We know a lot about our hurts and our hang-ups, but sometimes we refuse to see them. We deny them. I don't know if you know anyone like this, but they really seem to arc up. They really get angry if you criticise them or, or mention something that may reveal something of a fault or failing in them. They just get angry, right? You met people like that? They feel embarrassed and they get angry. I mean, we've seen it a lot lately in media. A lot of our world leaders, well, not so right lately, but a certain political leader recently, where, where someone in the, in the media pack will ask a question that seems to reveal a fault or failing or something wrong with the government or this person, leader in general, and they just arc up. They double down. They blame others. They completely disregard reality. Anyone know anyone like that or seen anyone like that on TV? It's not just world leaders that do it. It's humans all over. It's human nature. So there's a plank that we refuse to see, that we know is there and we refuse to see. But also, he says, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye, this is not just ignoring the plank. These are are things in our lives that we don't know are there. We don't see them. Things we don't know about ourselves. We have faults and failings, hurts and hang-ups that sometimes we are just not aware of. 
Let me say something else here. This is an interesting one because this is also true. If you've had hurts and hang-ups that have come about because of something in your past. Time and time again, I hear of people with with depression or anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder or an addiction or all these sorts of things that is driven by some hurt or abuse or mistreatment or neglect that has happened to them in their past, but they can't remember it because they've blocked it out. I don't know if you know anyone like that. But they can't see the plank, the things that are hurting them. And yet they go out of their way to avoid the topics and things like that. So whether we are actively in denial or whether we simply don't see, we all have these masks. We all have things that we try to hide, things that are hidden behind an other presentation of ourselves. Okay, Plex, specks and planks. Let's move on to fruit. Because the next thing that Jesus says is that you won't be able to do it forever. You may get away with it for a season. You may get away with it for a short time. But eventually, the fruit of your life will be obvious. Whether you see the plank or you don't. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Now let me just be, and make another quick point here. The evil stored up in your heart may not have been stored there by you. Does that make sense? Like I was saying before, there are a lot of planks, issues, hurts and hang-ups that that exist in our lives that we don't see. And a lot of the time, we didn't put them there. They're hurts and hang-ups and abuses and neglects and history that hurts. But they too, regardless of whether we stored them there or someone evil did or, or whatever did, they still hurt, they still hang up and they still cause us to put on the mask and be duplicitous. Hypocrisy is bad. It ruins relationships. It ruins trust. And sometimes in your life, you will find relationships failing and faltering and struggling, and you can't figure out why. And sometimes it's because it's a plank you can't see. Well, they are bad. Hypocrisy is bad. It ruins relationships. It ruins trust. And it ruins economies, societies, and governments. But but also, it is self-destructive. Eventually, says Jesus, it's pointless. The fruit will show. So, that's all very depressing. How do we fix it? How do we build our integrity? How do we deal with the planks and the specks? We do it by building a house, which is Jesus' third story, third point to this text. We build a house. So to build integrity, we need authenticity and vulnerability, right? Logical. We need to, be, we need to bring out and expose the planks and the beams in our lives. So we'll call that the roof. That's our final goal in building our house. To get a roof, you need some walls. And the walls we need are strength and courage to be vulnerable and authentic. Yeah? Now, you're not going to have courage or strength unless you build that on something else, on a solid ground, on solid floor. And in order to build strength and courage, we need to be secure in our own souls. We need to be comfortable in our own skins. Unlike Adam and Eve. To get to that stage, though, we need a foundation of something. You can't just build a house on top of the ground. You need a foundation. And that foundation is the knowledge that we are loved and affirmed by God. 
And that knowledge is based on the bedrock of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for you without question. That is the foundation. That is the rock that Jesus is talking about. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. Because then we build our lives up from there. We build our lives up from that truth, that belief, that fact. We live in the knowledge of the love of God based on the bedrock of his life, death, and resurrection. Then, as we grow more and more to know the love of God, we become more and more comfortable in our own skins. We we feel more acknowledged, more accepted, more affirmed by God and the universe. And then, then we have the strength to courageously pursue authenticity and vulnerability and piece by piece the faults, failings, hurts and hang-ups of our lives will be shared, unmasked and dealt with. See, then what do we find? We find we have strength that we didn't have before. Our ability to deal with circumstances and problems and life becomes greater. In modern counselling language, we call this resilience. Resilience is important because life isn't easy. You need the strength. That's resilience. Look how Jesus describes it. When a flood came, the torrent struck the house and couldn't shake it because it was well built. Integrity means owning our own story, not pretending to be someone else, not spinning our story to be smarter or dumber than we are, poorer than we are or richer than we are, better than we are, worse than we are. Integrity is simply owning the story God gave us to write. This morning, I want to encourage you to be vulnerable, to step out, to take a risk, to let down a mask a little so that people can see a little bit more of the real you. Bit by bit, as we reveal more of ourselves to the world, to our friends, to trusted friends, I'm not suggesting you uh, post all of your skeletons and closets and whatever else on Facebook. Facebook is not a safe place, in case you weren't aware. But we want to be a safe place. I want to encourage you to be vulnerable, to step out and here in this place to be known that you are accepted, loved, and affirmed by God. We as a church, we acknowledge that we are full of broken and sinful people. We are people who've made mistakes and still make them. We've been hurt in life. Some have been mistreated. Some have been discriminated against. Some have been abused and neglected. We are all human and we've experienced the good and the bad of human existence. We want to be a place where we can practice vulnerability, where we can share our planks, strengthen our integrity, built on the foundation of God's love. So to help us in this, we're going to sing a song. We're going to have a time of prayer. This song reminds us who we are. We are who God says we are. And God says we are worth dying for. So this song will help us realise that God has love for us regardless. And I invite you to pray in this time. During this song, you you can sing along if you want. But I also invite you to pray. And I want to invite you to ask the Holy Spirit, God himself in spirit form, to come into your life in a new and fresh way. In a new and fresh way that that reassures you of God's love for you. 
God's acceptance of you, God's affirmation of you. We, we want you to pray that the Spirit would bear witness, as our doctrinal statements would say. Bear witness to this deep truth within your soul so that you may live more free, more stronger, more accepting of yourself, more courageous. May that lead to an increased authenticity, boldness, courageous vulnerability that leads to a life of greater integrity, peace, and fulfillment. So in this type of prayer, I invite you to pray, to sing. Perhaps you'd like to come and to kneel. To, to kneel before God, where hundreds of people have knelt at these benches before, these seats before. Hundreds of people. You're welcome to come and to, to kneel, to be vulnerable before God and say, God, this is me. <laughs> it's funny, right? God knows all about us, right? He's God. So why does God encourage us to tell him all about our lives and ourselves? Why? Because then that gives him the opportunity to respond. And to say, I know, I love you. So I invite you to come, to kneel perhaps, to pray. To say, God, this has happened to me in life. Or I did this in life. Thank you for your love. Help me to deal with it. Help me to remove the logs from my eyes. And may I then be strengthened enough that I might be able to help others. Let's pray as we sing.